It's the second movie we've seen this year with the Roman centurion playing a key mm-hmm. role. And I don't know if you saw it, but you know, I show a lot of movies and the man that played the Roman centurion yeah, he also played in the island. He was Dr. Merrick. He was the ego character in this movie I used for teach, teaching awakening. But in this movie, in that movie, he, was, he played the ego straight on. And basically, uh, it was the main character who had to rise up in the end. His, he was, they were always at odds. The main character, um, he used a a reference to an American president who freed all the slaves, Lincoln. Mm -hmm. He rose up at the end, my name is Lincoln. You might remember the first Matrix movie, you know, my name is Neo. You know, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, and with the agent, and, and Neo rises up, my name is Neo in that subway kind of scene. But in this movie, you know, the, the, the first one we saw recently was a very powerful uh, movie, but the Roman centurion actually had a conversion experience, and in this one it was a little more like, like we were talking at the lunch table with, with Diana, and the, it was almost like the little Jesus was just looking him head on, and, and twice he said, you were there, you know, before, how do you know that? You know, that you saved me, and this and this. And at this point, you know, he was like, noticed in this movie, there's a lot of those scenes where, like when they said, what is your name? And, and the man next to him just said, he, he doesn't speak. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of those kind of scenes where, you know, it's good to know that as you wake up to who you truly are, the time and space will be arranged. You don't even have to defend yourself or figure it out. It's a little more like Lucy, where everything is orchestrated. Just the, may, the way is made clear when you are sure of your destiny and sure of your purpose. Which is just really, that's how the movie ended, to be a child of God. And you know, he says, you know, and he says, we're all, we're all children of God. But she said, but you're, you know, really here to, to live it. You know, not conceptually or not, you know, more like the cliché we're all, but actual, an actual experience. So, that was, that was very good, I thought, too, the way it ended. Mm-hmm. He really, that was a really powerful scene at the end of just him, his face and, you know, that whole point of living it, which is what, it's what Sarah was talking about this morning at the service, too. Just living it, really living it, really feeling it. comes a point where you, whatever concepts that have been helpful, there comes a point to toss them. Because you're really tossing aside all intellectual concepts and just saying, okay, it's time for an experience. And, and, and you don't know how the form of that experience will come to pass. But you do know that it's, it's just a destiny. There's nothing to stop it from coming, because it's the truth. And all you have to do is, is just stay so authentic with your feelings and so authentic with, with what you, you know deep in the core of your being. And then, yeah, it's, it seems crazy in this world that you can actually take no thought for what you shall wear or what you shall eat, take no thought for the morrow, take no thought for anything in form, because it goes against all of our conditioning where we're supposed to take lots of thought, <laughs> plan it, figure it out, analyze it, ensure it, you know, make it happen, work at it. Almost like a craftsman, you know, work, 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 and... And then it's like, in the end, even practice has to, has to go, because practice still involves time. That the last to go will be the practice, you know, where you don't... What's your spiritual practice? No, I don't. 
what's your spiritual pathway? The pathway has to disappear, the practice has to disappear, everything has to disappear. We were talking <coughs> last night and Stephen was just saying how he, when he, when he first felt he was to, uh, you know, start recording and doing these videos, but there was no way that you couldn't do it. It just, it just happened. There wasn't, there wasn't anything in the mind that was debating should, shouldn't, you know, all the... None of that, I just, it was sort of like something compelling to do. Compelling, right, yeah. Right, so I just, I just turned it on and started talking. Yeah. It's the same word I use when I first started to, to travel, people would say, why? Why would you just leave everything and go out? And I, I say, I was compelled, I use the exact yeah. word. But that's, you could really see it in this movie, he's a seven-year-old and yet he was compelled. <laughs> Even though the whole context of being a seven-year-old child and and in that day and age and everything, even going on to uh, to Jerusalem, and his, his older brother finally, James finally said he has to go because he's got to get answers. So you know, it's like that's why he's gone because they were like they couldn't imagine that he would have left that cave or walked away from them. And they couldn't imagine that somebody actually found them and, and took him. It was almost like, the, the, neither of those make any sense until the James spoke up and said, Oh, he has to find answers. That's why. And they all were, you know, like, they knew it. They knew that he was speaking the truth. And that was great. What a blessing, that, that movie. And then, what was the one we saw? Risen. Risen. Oh my gosh. Risen and the Young Messiah, because I had seen the trailers for both of them and I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. something's up this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're starting to have Jesus movies that are, yeah, yeah. That are really <laughs> hitting home now. It's like his very presence gives everyone he meets the opportunity. Are you going to go for Christ or the ego now? Like, what's your call? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? It's like in each one of those encounters with the Romans or everyone, everyone around him, just because he's so clear in it. Yeah. They had their call to make. Yeah, we had they had a pretty good picture of the younger Jesus through some of you know the Urantia book. But uh, Joseph in here, the father, you know, played a big role. But then, according to the Urantia book, um, that he died. It's this. It's this book that. Yeah, I've got a friend who studies it. Oh yeah. It yeah. Like yeah. According the to the first letter. Time I've heard anyone mention it except yeah. since. Yeah, I've I've met people in groups around the the country and all over the world that study it. And actually, um, the, the pre president of the Urantia Foundation came to Judy Scutch, the publisher of the course, and said, "How have you got the course all over the world?" And she, "What's your business plan?" And she said, "We don't have one. We pray at every." step of the way, we have no business plan. So they were interested, but in the Urantia book, Jesus' father dies at when he's 15. So he was, this was when he was seven. So he went on, he had a lot of things that he had to face as a teenager during those years, because for most children, male children at the time, 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, he was, he literally had to take on all kinds of face all kinds of things that most people don't face until much later in their life. Uh, you can imagine a parent dying at that age, and with all that we just saw here. So it's, it's interesting with this movie and the Urantia book and everything, it's starting to, it's starting to piece the puzzle together that, that he, he had a destiny, he was always aware there was some kind of huge destiny, but he had absolutely no clue of what that destiny was, nor could he. You know, now we're starting to see it, and certainly with The Course in Miracles we got a whole bigger context on that this is a dream world, and that it's not our destiny. Our destiny doesn't involve ending up anywhere in time and space. You know, our destiny is to wake up from the dream, but, but in order to do that we have to play our part. Which is, which is given to us moment by moment by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit and Jesus know that, where we're supposed to go, who we're supposed to meet, what we're supposed to do. And it's been great because 
what Stephen's been sharing is just coming here with Vicky, you can feel like things getting activated, like there's a whole yeah. a whole plan that's really all prearranged. It's already written, but we we haven't walked through it yet and then we we meet and we feel this energy and we feel this activation and and we feel it's it's huge, like it's way beyond the human understanding. No human could could possibly comprehend the context of that. But we feel it for sure and, and Jesus definitely felt it and felt it and and then had some temptations, you know, when he was in his late teens and then, you know, in the Bible it talks about him him uh, being you know, tempted by the devil forty days and forty nights, and and uh, it was kind of that interesting that they had the devil seen in this, just like they had the that devil character in Mel Gibson's movie. Remember Mary and the yeah, and Mary and the devil kind of when Jesus is walking, carrying the cross, the, the devil and Mary are are on each side of Jesus, and and they're both looking at each other. And it, that's kind of an interesting parallel. And then with this one, yeah, I really feel it's like it's all of these movies are coming in. We're just getting more of a bigger context to how important our lives are, not not so much in form, but in a much broader context in terms of the whole cosmos. Like you know, Jesus is such a symbol. It's it's such a an amazing rare symbol and the Urantia book basically says that what we would call Urantia or Earth is is one of the on a range of evolution of waking up to God it's it's a very crude planet so you have something like a Christ which is everything manifesting on one of the crudest planets in the cosmos and that's why we have these huge ripples that have been going on for the last 2,000 years, because because it's that that light is completely transcending time and space. It's like you were talking about the, going beyond the fifth, mm. you know, stage, stage or whatever. He was it was like manifesting that beyond mm. whatever that is, and and yet in seemingly in flesh and in scripts and scenarios of this world, which you know is is like a like a gulf that that we can't even imagine how far that that gulf seems to be but it's we're facing it dealing with it and we were talking at lunch the signs and symbols are just they just start to flooding into our awareness more and more of those little little synchronicities, those little nudges, those those little reminders of the purpose behind everything that we do. Even when you're talking about the Arantia book, see, the guy I'm going to see from here in California is a devotee of the Arantia book. Mm -hmm. He's the one who, oh, when I stayed there last time, or time before that, he was told me all, all about Arantia. He, was a bit, he came out of Vietnam a bit messed up. He went round to friends and that book was on the table. He said, what's this? And he said, they said, I don't know, someone left it here, you can have it if you want. He opened it, read it, and he's been devoted to it ever since. And I was saying to Vicky, I was telling Vicky about it, I don't know anyone who's ever heard of it apart from him. And the story of Jesus is in it. And then you start speaking about it today. Yeah. Well, yeah, you we see, know. that's the only this second is, time I've heard it. Yeah, this, You're the second man I've ever known who's mentioned it. This is 2016 and I had very, very devoted students in the early 1990s. And I came across the Ranch book when I was, in 1991, when I was on my first travels around the United States and Canada, I was at a, a creek bed in Sedona with one of those little pop-up camper trailers and and these this man and woman who were studying the Course and the Ranch book and all of these kind of real esoteric books 20 some 25 years ago they were like very deep into it and and they introduced me to it and then about 4 years after that I had all these people showing up telling me you are my teacher you know I we are your students and 
I was like, oh, okay, it, it was quite startling, but um, the biggest, like I mentioned about that book in the, in the office, The Mystical Teachings of Jesus, the, most of them were all raised in Christianity, but, but they couldn't comprehend what the Course was saying. It just was too far beyond what they could comprehend. So I made that book, The Bible Course Companion, but I also made this book that people talk about, where I took passages from the Arantia book, the last section, The Life and Teachings of Jesus, and the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by Levi, and uh, Absence from Felicity, that Ken Wapnick wrote, where Jesus describes the crucifixion and the resurrection in great detail. And I, and I put, I took huge amounts of chunks from the Course, and I made this big book that had all these kind of amazing teachings in, and I put a pink cover on the front and a pink cover on the back, and I put a fish sign on it, and it was called the Fish Book. And so people have heard me for the last 20 years talking about the Fish Book. That was a composite book that the Holy Spirit built for my students that had all those teachings together in one place, because the Arantia book is full of parables too. Also Jesus did a lot of praying, not just the Lord's Prayer, but he had these big, long, beautiful prayers are all in the Arantia book. And so that was to be the bridge for the early students who who couldn't quite grasp the course. They needed some, they said, what, what did they do for a bank account? And how did they handle lodging? And how did Jesus interact with each one of the apostles? Because they were, they were just human beings, struggling. And so I just cried through reading that last section, that whole section of the Rancher book, because I could see how patient Jesus was working with everyone, how he would work with Th Thomas, who was always doubting, and doubting everything, how he, he would work with Peter, who was, was very articulate, but he was so impulsive. He was very impulsive. And, and so how do you work with impulsivity in this realm? That's what I found, that's why I, I put that in that book for all the students, because they said, watch how he does it. Learn from not just his words and his prayers, but look at his actions. How patient he is, how he's, how friendly, how loving, how he just, regardless of what they're going through, he's still connected. He never holds it against them. So yeah, it's, it's good. It's very, it's synchronistic that you're going out to visit that man. Well, he's up on his book and read the Jesus section now. <laughs> 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 I mean, so I've looked through it, it's a big, big book, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, just... I've looked through it and I've seen the Jesus bit and I've read sort of flicked Yeah, the bit. last section, but, uh, the life the and teaching, the fourth section. I'll, I'll go in there, I'll, I'll yeah. read his book. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks for telling me that. <laughs> 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 well, I knew it was there, but it wouldn't occur to me to read it unless you just pointed that out. Yeah. You know, so it... Yeah, it's... All, a, once again, it falls in place. Yeah. Yeah. It all just clicks in, it all drops in our lap. All, all we have to do is desire it and then everything else comes like a magnet, mm -hmm. comes rushing in. The people we're supposed to meet, the books we're supposed to read, the movies we're supposed to watch. The lives we're supposed to lead. The lives we're supposed to lead, it's all scripted and given to us. Yeah. Well, it all happened at once anyway, didn't it? Because it happened in a timeless environment, in an instant. But once we're trapped inside the dream, there's no time outside of it. So Jesus being outside of it, can see it from A to B, he can see it from beginning to end in a way we can't comprehend. But he can see all the obstacles in our path. If we let him, he just shows the way around them. If we don't let him, we'll bang into them. It's as simple as that. Yeah. I was just speaking at a, at a course gathering over in... Um, in Colorado, and I was saying, you know, it's like when it says Jesus is in charge of the plan of atonement, because Gary kept recognizing that Jesus, he kept emphasizing in his talk that Jesus wasn't a leader, he was a follower, and he just had to follow, follow, follow the Holy Spirit. And then when I got up to give my talk, I said, yes, that's exactly what he went through in his process of awakening. But let's not forget, he now is the leader of the plan. He has completed his part perfectly. And so I flipped it around and, and did my whole talk on he's the leader. Meaning, if he's the leader and he says, I can perform miracles through you, I will arrange time and space for you if you will perform miracles, that that means that everything that seems to be happening 
in all of time and space, even down to the tiniest nuances at the electronic at electron level or the subatomic particle level, all of that is is ultimately being arranged by by Jesus just for the atonement experience. And what's even better is there never is a mistake that that the Christ, because the Christ has completed his part perfectly, is a, is arranging time and space which is just really a past script that's over and done, but he's literally using the symbols to bring the mind into that perfect alignment as, as the Christ. And therefore that means all things do work together for good. But for those that love the Lord, in the Bible it says, in the Course it says, there are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. And everything is in perfect divine order, and it's only the ego that tries to add something to the script, or take something away, or say, wonderful, wonderful, but, it wants to throw a but in there. <laughs> Things would be better if something was different, and it's not the case. Things would never be better if they were different. Things are perfect exactly as they are. Always have been and always will be. It's, it's the divine order. So that's, but that's, that's the state of mind that's in the mind. You can't have that state of mind and keep judging the script. Oh, this, it was, would have been a perfect meal except, you know, when you go to a restaurant. No, <laughs> it is a perfect meal. <laughs> they didn't have my favorite thing. Oh, no, no, no. That Don't be judging favorite, favorite things. You know, all the things that would make it less than perfect are, are the illusions. It's always perfect. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. you, some of you remember Sam who was with me, but she's down in Mexico where I just left and she had a quiet day yesterday and then she was stirred up and she went to, to sit on the balcony and she watched from the balcony as this, this men, a group of men and this man, as they put this, they captured this puppy and they drug this puppy along and they began torturing this puppy and the more, she just watched from the balcony and, and as they tortured it and tortured it, she could just, she was watching the whole scene before her and then they tied the puppy to a, a tree and that's when she just started screaming, screaming, but this was across the street in this Mexico, they couldn't hear her. It was as if she was just watching that whole scene for a purpose and she screamed and screamed and stop it, stop it. And then they took a pistol out and shot the puppy. And she called me, then she ran down to find, looked for Lisa and she couldn't find anybody at the center. And But it just, it was one of those things that brought up so much intensity. And then she just sent me a you know, big, long, long, long Facebook message like, what is the purpose of this? You know, she loves animals and, and this whole thing of victims and powerlessness and helplessness and torture and cruelty. It just brought everything was gushing up like a geyser from the unconscious because of that scene. And so that's, yeah, she's still dealing with it, just, it, it was just one scene, she just finds her mind so drawn to interpreting that. What we were just talking about, there has to be, beyond the veil of these images, of these past images, there has to, there is that light that's still shining there, and that's really, that light is all there is to see. That the body's eyes were made not to see, the body's ears were made not to hear, some of you have heard of that acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. It's a big trick to keep the mind stuck, trapped in guilt and pain and fear. And so, what's the purpose of that scene? You know, that, that scene has only one purpose, is, is the spirit using it in this timing to bring up the unconscious darkness so it can be handed over and seen to be impossible. It has no other purpose, that scene. If you try to interpret that scene from a linear way, it just, it's its shocking. You know, she, she kept saying to me, I'm shocked. 
I, my knees were quivering. I was just quivering while I was watching it. And then she started thinking, you know, you were just here and nothing ever happened like that when you were here and Jason was just here and, and then you, you all went off to your next places and why did I have to see this scene now? And I say, well, it's, it's just coming up into awareness because it's, it's time. The mind is giving permission, saying, okay, it's time for me to face this belief in victimization, this belief in powerlessness, this belief in helplessness, this belief in cruelty. And because it was a man who was doing it, all of her projections onto men, her whole life, her father, any man she's ever known, you know, was all there, brought to the surface, in, in just in watching that one scene. And also the screaming and screaming and not being heard. She saw that that was a pattern in her life of not speaking up and disconnecting and fear of speaking up and feeling like, why is it that none of the men in my life have ever listened to me? They never listened to me, ever. You know, this was like screaming and it was like they just continued on with the whole scene without even hearing one word that was screamed and then boom, with the pistol at the end. That was like, you know, at the end, the intensity around that. But when you start to think of it, that's whatever comes up into your awareness, it's just that your mind is, is ready to forgive it. You're reaching a point where it's been pushed out of awareness, it's been buried, it's been, that's what the unconscious mind is. It's, it's just a bunch of assumptions and beliefs that the mind is so terrified of, it doesn't even want to raise them to the light. It doesn't ever want to see those thoughts or memories again. But, but they have to be, you might say, overlooked with the light of the Holy Spirit. And they have to be allowed up, because they aren't going to get healed if they're pushed down. And if, if they're pushed away from awareness, they, they won't be healed that way. So it's just, whether we go through physical symptoms, whether we seem to witness a scene like that. People are watching nowadays, I think Sylvester Stallone was just over in Nice, vacationing with his, uh, with his wife and his three children, and just after he took a little self-photo was when the whole, the truck over there, and the shootings, and 80-some people, killed and scores injured and everything, and it was kind of on an idyllic southern Mediterranean French day with fireworks going off, you know, celebrating with fireworks, it's a summer day, one of the most idyllic kind of settings, and then all of a sudden this truck, you know, r r big truck going down the street, knocking people over, rolling over children, children, people, bodies flying like bowling pins and guns, shooting gun, and all this stuff, you know, these kind of things, you know, we were talking, was it last night, where it used to be, it happened every once in a while, but it seems like every day, every yeah. week, yeah. if you just turn on the news, There's something happening somewhere, somewhere, somewhere on the planet There's every day, somewhere. and it's just coming, it's just this unconscious coming now, coming into awareness, and people have forecast earth changes, for a long time. Well, there's plenty of earth changes, but there's a lot more going on than earth changes with suicide bombings and twin towers coming down and planes taking off from the Netherlands and heading over for Malaysia and getting sh shot down, just dis disappearing with missiles, you know, commercial, you know, all kinds of things happening. And, and you might say that's really part of our wake-up call right now is there's a soft voice inside saying, my beloved child, choose again. Like, it's just asking us to see the world differently. It's asking us to forgive the attack thoughts. Because if attack is real, then pain is real, then guilt is real, then fear is real. If attack is real, and the whole belief that the mind could separate that we could pull our mind away from, from God and take on a whole perception that has nothing to do with God is, is the belief that God can be attacked. And then what we're seeing is a projection of that belief that separation is real. And it's being acted out really in graphic terms now 
for us. We even did a, I don't know if Stephen and Vicky got a chance to see it, but we did, remember that video with, yeah. it, with all those, mm -hmm. we, we put together a video of, of a lot of the seeming horrendous, tragic scenes that have been going on, and then we interspliced it with teachings from me speaking on the Course, and used it in combination with the graphic seeming violence to try to bring, bring a bigger context, like this is a wake-up call. It's the only meaningful way to interpret our experiences now, is a wake-up call. The racial things that are going on in the United States, you know, I used to, when I would travel to all these 40-some countries, occasionally the State Department would issue warnings for travel in other countries for American citizens. Now, when I was in Mexico for the first time, there were countries in the world that were issuing warnings for travel to the United States because of the racial things, police killings, riots, you know, protests. You know, protests. it's interesting now, you know, that, 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 that Dallas was targeted for that because there really isn't racial situations in, in Dallas, you know? up till the point that that happened. Yeah, the ego was like, it was trying to, a place where the police work together so much with the, the community, Black Lives Matter, and then the ego is like, yeah, well, we'll just, we'll just get that. make that as, a, as an extreme point. But that's what was happening here, you can see this ego character in the movie. Mm -hmm. Like with the, the boy, it, it rolls the apple, it's eating the apple, mm -hmm. it rolls the apple out, the boy falls yeah. falls over, dies, and then he goes, it whispers, he did it. <laughs> you see, it's a total setup, and then it's projected back onto Jesus. <laughs> right. yeah. it, it, and that's even what the in, ego does. Even in Dallas, since that happened, it's, it, 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 they wanted to cause separation, but it didn't work. It didn't work. It, 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 They're all... It all went the other way, didn't it? Which is the right side. Yeah. They were still like hugging each other instead of... Yeah, like I saw that. I saw that video, yeah. yeah. The, the police yeah. going out and the all that. The exact opposite of what they wanted to happen happened, and that is just so yeah. good. Yeah. It's a real start of a turn around that. Is. The miracle. That's yeah. why we're here. We're here to yeah. to demonstrate those miracles, yeah. Yeah. That's the trick of the whole scene talking about. <laughs> Yeah, that that's a pretty, a pretty f intense video, but yeah. We did another one on addiction. All addiction is the desire for connection, because addiction is so widespread with all the, around the planet. Desire for connection, yeah. Yeah, so we showed in graphic terms, you know, the, the addictions acted out, all kinds of addictions, and then brought in the teachings, because more and more, you know, we're getting people that are collaborating with graphic skills and all kinds of things, like, let's put together teaching devices that show the intensity of the ego, act it out, and then offer the relief, and offer the solution, side by side. Let's put them side by side. So those are, yeah, I think that's part of our calling too, is to make it, make it, if we have to learn through contrast, then let's learn through contrast, if it takes even extreme contrast, then there's something going on in the mind saying, bring it on, we need to heal, we need to face whatever, whatever's been pushed away, we have to face it. This whole movie reminded me of the line in the Matrix from, from Morpheus when he says to Neo, when you know you're the one, you won't have to dodge bullets. Like the whole thing was a demonstration of complete mm -hmm. defenselessness. It just made it so attractive to be a constant, like, devotion to mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this firmness, like, you will not touch me. Like, the Baptist made them. Yeah. That was like the, or the, not having to dodge the bullets, it's like yeah. stop right in front of them. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. That's the one I have sent to, to Sam so she can see it, because there's, there's a powerlessness, helplessness, victim. Where does it end? It, it ends in that state of mind. 
do not touch me. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, where you have dominion over the world. That's that's a workbook lesson from the Course. My capital self is ruler of the universe. Even in this world, it is I that rule my destiny. What happens is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. That's very clear in the Course. We have dominion over the world. We also have dominion in, in heaven, because that's our natural state of oneness, but even in this world, he, he makes it very clear, you're never the victim of every, anything. You can, you can choose to perceive yourself as the victim, but that's not the truth, not the reality. So, It's a decision, really, isn't it? Yeah. You've decided to be that. You've decided to be... Decided to take offence, decided to be upset, decided it wasn't the truth. It's just a, it's actually a decision. Yeah. You've always got a choice here. Because in yeah. oneness there isn't no choice, there's just oneness. What can you choose between oneness? It's just oneness. It's where God, there's no judgment in oneness because there's nothing to judge anything against. It's just one thing. Like God has no name because when you're the only thing that exists, why do you need a name? Yeah. It's as simple as that. We're here in this opposite existence where everything is split and everything... <sighs> because it's opposite, there's conflict. In one, there's no conflict. There's no yeah. opposite, so there's no conflict, so it's perfect peace. Yeah, you there's know? one part in the Course with all the talk of forgiveness where he says, awareness of dreaming is the function of God's teachers. So, you can't be the dreamer and a dream figure. You can't be the Holy Son of God and a human being. You can't be both. It's one or the other. And it's that causation thing you mentioned that if Jesus says, you are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have or ever will. So it's like, you know, the dreamer has to come back to the dreaming position. And, it, and that's where, from that position, it's that state of mind, don't touch me. Because we know that with nighttime dreams, it doesn't matter if it's a fire-breathing dragon. If we're in a lucid dream going, whew, ha ha ha. It's not, I'm not this, <laughs> I'm not this character. Dreaming. You can have right fun right. in a dream when you're oh, yeah. dreaming. You can it all gets good. throw all the flames you want. Because <laughs> these bodies, your body's not real, but this body, none of the bodies are real. So that's, that's it. And to do that, it, again, you know, is to have no investment in anything of the world. That's why we're called, like Buddha said too, also to empty the mind of attachments, because as soon as you think you attach to something or you identify with something, then then you will defend it. And if you want to be defenseless, then you have to be detached from, from appearances. There can't be any appearances. I know for Sam that that was a big step. I mean, that's almost like her worst nightmare is what she saw. She just saw her worst nightmare, her, just acted out in Graphic colors, you know, just from a balcony watching. That was yesterday? Yeah. I was doing the section on false empathy in uh, my training. And I was writing about, because when I stayed up there, it wasn't, of course, the massacre of the dog, but that dog that barks and just jumps off the yeah. tree, and I was just watching, sitting there. And I was thinking about that yesterday. Yeah. So I know what tree you're talking Yeah, that's it. She, she's watched this, she's been on that balcony before, but this was like, yeah. The scene in The Godfather, or you know, something where it's like, here we go, with the horse head in the bed, or you know, whatever the worst nightmare just got completely acted out, and so, and it can only be for forgiveness. It can only be for this deep purge of all these thoughts. It's the only purpose anything can have, and that's that. As extreme as that seems, I still always quote that part in the Course where Jesus says, the dreams that you think you like can hold you back just as much as those in which the fear is entered. So when you start to think of all the happy memories, maybe with family and friends and whatever, that shows you how sneaky the ego. That thing that she watched is now a horrific memory that she's facing in her mind. It's like a, a, a bright honor. But the dreams you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is entered. Because dreams are dreams. There aren't good dreams, bad dreams. We, we've got this Star Trek episode that I show over and over that we labeled, it's called The Emissary, but we call it Time's End. Because it's, you know, 
everybody knows the Star Trek, the, the Klingons, the Borg, the Romulans, you know, all the different ones. They pierce, they go through a wormhole, and they pierce all of time and space and move into complete abstract light. They come in encounter with the light. Mm -hmm. And the light cannot understand opposites. It cannot, it, it's always, you know, it's, he's protesting. He even tries to talk about baseball, how, how exciting baseball is. And, and basically the light's response to, as he, he describes how the pitcher pitches the ball and the hitter swings and the ball could go anywhere inside these lines. And he's talking about how he values not knowing what's coming next. And the light says, you value your ignorance of what is to come? That's the reply from the light to all of his enthusiasm about baseball. And it goes on with his relationship, with his child, everything that's valuable seemingly to the ego in this world. This little episode that I show is maybe 35 minutes. And then my commentary coming in, you know, even down to romance where, you know, he's thinking of the memory of how he loved, he's watching a memory of him kissing his wife on a picnic, uh, on a little thing, in a picnic, and then and he's like, he's got this face like, oh, he's missing, so missing that. And the light's right there going like this. Because the light doesn't know what lips are, and it, the light doesn't know what a kiss is. It's deep. <laughs> this is deep. Because most of the time you're always facing different species, but this takes you actually to abstraction of just pure light beyond duality, beyond opposites completely. And that's why I keep showing that little 35 minute clip over and over and over, because it's, it's a spectacular teaching device as far as for Course in Miracles students. It's, it's top of the line, it's spectacular. Was that an episode or part of a film? It was, it was part, it was an episode from um, Deep, Space. Deep Space Nine, and, and it was called The Emissary, and I put it in my Quantum Forgiveness book too for people to watch as one of their exercises when they're going through yeah. forgiveness. But it's, you know, most movies don't ever have the light as the contrast. It's always just images. Yeah. Battling, contriving, fighting, trying to win, you know, all the, all the, even it's Star Wars, movies. the light and the dark force and everything, yeah. and there's some big battle. This was just pure abstraction beyond all of the images. So, yeah, that's that's a good one. If you get a chance to see that one, that's really good. It's amazing. I get really animated when I teach using really deep teaching tools too. I get like a child and get really excited and that's what our movie watchers Guide to Enlightenment's about. We we put a lot of movies, really good teaching movies, but with lots of spliced in commentary to kind of penetrate even deeper through what the movie is teaching, you know. I think Jesus is having fun with the movies right now. He's like these, you know. Here's my latest. Or wait till that one comes out with Ian McGregor. I'll be like, ha ha ha. It's all over and done for the ego. The, the war is over. It never began. <laughs> it never began.